Okay, so we left off last time talking about these graphs that compare, we're plotting the rate of photosynthesis as CO2 fixation, but you could do the same thing as oxygen evolution or sugar production or rate of electron transport. They'd, they would all be proportional to each other as a function of either external ambient CO2 concentration or internal CO2 concentration. And I just want to remind you that we recognize that C4 plants have lower compensation points, that is where the rate of respiration and the rate of photosynthesis balance each other. So you have a net CO2 fixation or net oxygen evolution of zero. The C4 plants have a lower compensation point than C3 plants because they have an enzyme that has much higher affinity for CO2, PEP carboxylase compared to Rubisco in the C3 plants. We also saw that the internal CO2 in a C4 plant is drawn much down much more than the internal CO2 in a C3 plant. Again, because Rubisco has such low affinity for carbon dioxide. The last thing we left off with was talking about the fact that at high CO2, C3 plants actually do more photosynthesis than C4 plants. And what was the explanation for that? Why did we say that at high CO2 concentrations, C3 plants can do more photosynthesis than C4 plants? The silence is deafening. Michael. Uh, nope, not, not really, because remember, PEP. PEP still has a pretty high affinity, so even when you saturate it, it still should be able to work pretty well. Well, the C3 plants aren't concentrated, like you're not going to the extra step where the C4 plants are. Okay. So that will slow that just to go through. Okay, so C3 plants aren't concentrating CO2. What's, the, what's needed to concentrate CO2? What does the C4 plant have to do that C3 plants don't have to do? Uh, C3 plants do photorespiration, but how much photorespiration is going to go on at high CO2? Not a lot. Not a lot. Good. Okay, so keep going then. Why does the C3 plant do better than the C4 plant under conditions where there's high CO2, no photorespiration? What does the C4 plant have to do all the time that the C3 plant doesn't have to do? Actively transport CO2. Does it cost anything to do that? Energy, right? Two extra ATP. So the C4 plant all the time, low CO2, low CO2, high CO2, is always spending those extra ATPs. But the C3 plant, under conditions where there's no photorespiration, high CO2, it isn't spending those extra ATPs. So it can do more photosynthesis. So let's take this piece of information that under high CO2, C3 plants should be able to do better than C4 plants. And think about the question we started with several lectures ago, and that is, why haven't C4 plants just outcompeted C3 plants? What does this suggest to you is a key component of determining the distribution of C3 and C4 plants. And don't, don't think about what you know about the distribution of C3 and C4 plants. Think about what this tells you. Under what conditions would you expect C3 plants to do better than C4 plants? This graph tells you. What's the answer? High CO2, right? So does the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere differ very much from place to place? No, it doesn't. So the direct effects of CO2 cannot be the answer to the question. Here's another way to look at this problem that will help you. This is, a, this is showing the quantum yield of photosynthesis, that is, how many oxygens are evolved per photon absorbed, and compares this over a temperature range for both C4 plants and C3 plants. You've seen graphs similar to this already, but we haven't really talked about the explanation for it. What we see is that for C4 plants, that curve is flat. The efficiency in terms of 
CO2 fixed per photon absorbed doesn't change with CO2 concentration because the physiology of C4 photosynthesis doesn't change with CO2 concentration. It's constitutively spending those two extra ATP throughout the whole temperature range. It doesn't turn those on and off just because CO2 is high. But what about C3 plants? How do we account for the fact that the CO2 fixed per photon absorbed goes down? What could account for the fact that this is going down? Say that again? Stomata or closing. OK, so what would that do? What would that limit? It would lower the CO2 concentration within the leaf. Yeah, so we would expect that this might have something to do directly or indirectly with CO2. Because if CO2 gets lower, then photorespiration is going to be more of a problem in the amount of CO2 fixed per photon absorbed is going to go down. And that's correct. And what you're suggesting makes perfect sense, but it's not the most important answer. The most important answer has to do with gas solubility. Where is Rubisco getting its oxygen or its CO2 or its oxygen from? The air? It's getting it from water, right? So we need to think about the solubility of oxygen and CO2 in cytoplasm to be able to answer this question. Because we said it is not changes in atmospheric CO2 that's important. Because atmospheric CO2, unless you live you know, a few blocks from a power plant, a coal burning power plant, the atmospheric CO2 doesn't vary sufficiently. So what happens to gas solubility with increasing temperature? What happens to gas solubility? I mean, pardon me? It decreases. Uh, not when you freeze it. When you freeze it all, though, when you get it colder, yes. So unlike solutes like sugars and things like that, where the solubility goes down with increasing temperature, gas solubility, sorry, it's the other way around. With sugars and things like that, solubility goes up with increasing temperature. With gases, it's the other way. Why is that? Why does gas solubility go down with increasing temperature? You know the answer to this. Because that increasing temperature, you want to be moving around more. Yeah, so? So they're not going to be soluble. They're going to come out there and expand. There's more chance for them to escape, I think, is maybe the better way to say it. Because solubility requires that there's some interactions between the gas molecules and the water. If there's more thermal energy, then the gas molecules have a greater chance of overcoming those interactions in this case. Right. Okay, so this is all makes sense, that the gas solubility actually decreases as the temperature goes up. But the key to understanding all of this stuff with C3 and C4 plants is that CO2 and oxygen solubility change differently with temperature. So the concentration of oxygen relative to the concentration of CO2, and both of these are dissolved. This ratio goes up with increasing temperature. That is, there's relatively more oxygen or relatively less carbon dioxide that can be dissolved in water or in cytoplasm as the temperature goes up. So that's the explanation for this phenomenon. As the temperature goes up, the availability of CO2 relative to oxygen goes down in the cytoplasm, and photorespiration becomes more of a problem. But there's an effective compensation point here, somewhere around 25 to 30 degrees, that below that temperature, the photorespiratory losses in C3 plants are less than the energy, extra energy that C4 plants spend for CO2 concentrating mechanisms. So at relatively lower temperatures, the C3 plants are more efficient. And at higher temperatures, the C4 plants are more efficient. <laughs>
And this is what explains the geographic distribution of C3 and C4 plants. C4 plants tend to be more tropical, and C3 plants tend to be more temperate. Now, obviously, there's other things involved, too, particularly water and nitrogen availability, because we know that C4 plants are more water use efficient and more nitrogen use efficient. But the primary mechanism that determines the distribution of C4 and C3 plants is related to gas solubility as a function of temperature. So what's going to happen as if global warming continues and atmospheric CO2 continues to increase? What would we expect to happen under those circumstances? What's going to happen if atmospheric CO2 continues to increase to this sort of competition? Who's going to benefit most from increasing atmospheric CO2? C3 plants or C4 plants? C3 plants, right? So we would expect, perhaps, that this curve will shift to higher and higher temperatures. The study question for lecture topic 11 deals with this. For if those of you that have looked at it, it's asking about the effects of increasing atmospheric CO2 and some of the other complicating factors that you need to take into account. OK, so I hope what we've done now is brought together a lot of the sort of environmental, ecological things that, quest that brought up questions in your mind when we were talking about C3 and C4 photosynthesis. Um, that light, temperature, oxygen and CO2, nitrogen, all of the water are all going to be a factors that are going to be potentially affecting the competition between C3 and C4 plants. And if you just look at one of them, if you only consider one, you're likely to be in trouble because there's lots of things that potentially can be involved. Okay, any questions on this before we go on? All right. So what we're going to start talking about now is oops, something that we've mentioned several times but not gotten into any detail, and that is that the products of photosynthesis the triose phosphate and the sucrose that are made in the leaves must be distributed throughout the plant to all the non-photosynthetic parts of the plant in order for the plant to be able to survive. The roots, we know the roots need lots of energy for active transport. That energy is ultimately dependent upon sugars that are produced by photosynthesis. So we have to have some mechanism of transporting the products of photosynthesis throughout the plant to places where those products are needed, to metabolic sinks. Places in the plant where metabolism is using up products to support growth or storage or whatever might be going on there. We'll talk more about this idea of metabolic sinks in just a minute. So we know that the tissue that's involved in transportation of the products of photosynthesis to the rest of the plant is the phloem tissue. And obviously, the requirements for transport in the phloem are it's at the most basic level going to be similar to transport in the xylem. That is, diffusion will not work over the distances involved. Right? For even for plants that are just a few centimeters tall, diffusion is too slow to account for the translocation of the products of photosynthesis. So it's got to be bulk flow, pressure driven bulk flow. So the question we need to think about is how are the pressure gradients produced that allow for transport in the flow? Say that again. Um, so we're talking about vascular plants, of course. So in non-vascular plants, does do the products of photosynthesis diffuse? That's a good question. Or how do? I don't know enough I mean, about. Does it grow? I don't know enough about the anatomy of non-vascular plants to to say much about how that works. I mean, I can tell you I know in in macroalgae. 
So a lot of algae that, you know, big macrophytes, tens of meters tall sometimes. Um, there's very little long distance transport. So the tissues close to the, the base of the plant are largely supported, supported by photosynthesis in tissues right nearby. There's no transport over really long distances in most of them. I don't know whether that's true in non-vascular land plants or not. That's a good question. I just don't know the answer to it. Whether there's conducting tissue that does something like phloem does, but it's not phloem, I don't, I don't know the, the answer to that. Okay, so there's lots of uh, there's other conditions that we need to think about moving things around in the plant, organic compounds around in the plant. Um, so, for example, nitrogen-containing compounds, amino acids. In some plants, nitrogen is taken up in the roots and reduced to amino acids in the roots. In other plants, the, the nitrogen from the soil is translocated to the leaves. And then those nitrogen compounds need to be distributed throughout the plant. We also talked about moving nutrients around within the plant. So, for example, in nitrogen-limited plants, nitrogen is mobilized from the old leaves and translocated to the new leaves. Right? So these all require the ability of the plant to move organic compounds from one place in the plant to the other. And the way this always goes is from metabolic sources to metabolic sinks. And we need to keep in mind that sources and sinks are dynamic. So for example, flowers are developmental sinks. They're not there all the time. They're only there part of the time. They're sinks when they're there. They're not sinks when they're not there. And the, the flowers happen out on the ends of branches. So that means sometime during the year, stuff has to flow from the leaves towards the end of the branches where the rest of the year, stuff flows from the leaves down towards the roots. So we have to be able to think about this in terms of bidirectional transport. Things traveling in different directions. Obviously, they're not traveling together in the same phloem if they're moving in different directions by bulk flow. So we need to think about how that might happen. Leaves are another good example. Young leaves, when they're first developing, they're sinks. They're taking up the products of photosynthesis from neighboring leaves. But as they get larger, they become sources. Right? So there's dynamics to this as well. The roots are always sinks. Well, almost always sinks. OK. So the, need we, the thing we need to think about is if we're going to generate bulk flow from metabolic sources to metabolic sinks, how do we generate the pressure gradient that drives that bulk flow? And even if you haven't heard about it, the mechanism should be relatively apparent to you. If you're accumulating solutes here because of production of those solutes, then that increases the, makes the solute potential more negative and water enters osmotically. The pressure goes up. In the sinks, you're using up those solutes. The solute potential is less negative. Water leaves and makes the pressure lower. And so then he's <coughs> Excuse me, then you just need some sort of plumbing system to connect them. So we'll talk about this in more detail in just a minute. Okay, so how do we know about foam transport? What evidence is there for this sort of thing? Well, there's a couple things we can talk briefly about. There's a very simple experiment you can do. Take an older leaf and enclose it in a plastic bag and fill that plastic bag with C14 labeled CO2. And then ask, where does the, carb the radioactive carbon go? And what you see is the radioactive carbon goes primarily to younger leaves on the same side of the plant. It means there's some sort of preferential connection that has a sidedness to the plant. This is an obligate. We'll see that you can change this. But without, change, without manipulating the plant, there is a preferential transfer on one side of the plant to the, from the older leaves to the younger leaves. There has to be some sort of established pathway. Okay. Um, another one that you can do, how many of you have gone hiking down in Six Mile Creek? Anybody who hiked down in Six Mile Creek? So what kind of interesting animals live down there that you can see the results of as you hike down there? Beavers. There's lots of beavers that live in Six Mile Creek. 
And how does a beaver kill a tree? Yeah, it girdles the, it bite, chews the bark off all the way around and waits for the tree to die, and then, then it can tip it over or get it to fall over more easily. What happens if you girdle a plant, if you break the bark off all the way around, what do you see in that plant that's happening? The bark above the girdle swells a lot. In other words, there's water that's trying to move down through the phloem. The phloem in a woody tree is on, uh, on the outside in the bark. That bark swells above the girdle because there's pressure pushing downward there. Right? So here's an example of pressure move, trying to move water and solutes from metabolic sources in the leaves towards the sinks and the roots. But somehow that's gotten cut off by the beaver eating the bark, and it swells up as a, as a result of that pressure. We'll talk more about how that happens in just a minute. Another experiment that's been done that is relevant to this is you can take a leaf. This is a, a micrograph of the leaf showing the minor vein patterns. All these white things are minor veins. And the experiment was take a leaf, peel the epidermis off, and then paint some radioactively labeled sucrose on the leaf. And what you see is very quickly all the sucrose, all the radioactivity ends up in the minor veins in a matter of seconds. It's very quickly taken up into the minor veins. So we have the capacity for long distance transport from specific sources to sinks. And we also have the capacity of getting the sugars from the cells in the leaf into the veins very, very quickly. Okay, so th this is all giving us clues that there's a pathway built into this to take the products of photosynthesis from the mesophyll cells in the leaf and be able to deliver it to sinks in the plant. Another really interesting uh, evidence of transport in the phloem is this guy. Recognize it? Any entomologists here? It's an aphid. Aphids are phloem feeding insects. They do something very clever. They got this mouth part here called a stylet, and they are very good using that stylet, sticking it into the tissue and finding the sieve elements of the phloem. They stick their stylet right into the phloem. So you think, well, the phloem's got lots of good stuff in it. Actually, what the aphids are after are nitrogen-containing compounds. They don't really care about the sugar very much. They, they use some of the sugar, but they're most interested in, in nitrogen-containing compounds. And what happens is we'll see that the phloem is under quite high pressure. And that pressure is literally pushing liquid and all the sol solutes dissolved in it through this stylet up into the aphid. And what happens is off the butt end of the aphid, these drops of honeydew form. Any of you park your cars under trees around here in the summertime? What do you get all over the windshield? All these little tiny sticky drops on your windshield. That's honeydew from aphids. The sugar and water are basically being forced through its body. It's taking out the nitrogen containing compounds. And when that drop gets big enough, it falls on your car or on your head or whatever. And it's sugar water. That's the stuff that's in the phloem. So plant biologists, being the really clever people that they are, they come along and they take the aphid when it's, it, when it's got its stylet stuck into the phloem, and they, they blast it with a little CO2 to basically anesthetize it. And then they take a razor blade or a laser and <laughs> they cut the aphid off, leaving its stylet stuck into the phloem. And drops of phloem sap come out, and they collect it and measure what's in it. And this is still by far the best mechanism for specifically testing what's in the phloem. There's no like little needles and things that you can stick in there because it's really hard to hit the phloem. The aphids hit it every time. They know what they're doing. So this, most of the data that we have on phloem sap content comes from letting the aphid stick its stylet in there and then cutting off the aphid and leaving the stylet and letting the phloem sap drip out and collect it. Okay. So that brings up the Interesting question. What is in this liquid that's dripping out of the phloem? So if we look at the distribution of compounds in here, mostly it's sugars. I don't know if you can see this from the back, but mostly it's sugars. 
but there's also some amino acids, organic acids, and some inorganic ions as well. In fact, if you look carefully, there's also there's proteins, there's messenger RNA that's translocated in the phloem. There's a lot of interesting molecules that are being transported around, many of which have nothing to do with energy or nitrogen. They have to do with signaling between different parts of the plant. The, the phloem is being used as a pathway to translocate signaling molecules from one part of the plant to another. Okay. So if we look in more detail at the compounds that are there, one of the things that we see is the, the composition, particularly the sugar composition of the phloem, is very species specific. One set of species will transport one kind of sugars and another set of species will transport other kinds of sugars. So as we mentioned, I think in a couple lectures ago, the sugars that are not transported are the ones we normally think about glucose or fructose or mannose, which is another common sugar in plants. These are not transported. These monosaccharides are not transported. And remember I said these guys have a free aldehyde group. Don't worry if you don't remember from organic chemistry what an aldehyde group is. It's more reactive. So the reason they don't translocate these monosaccharides is because there's a greater chance they'll go through some undesirable reaction over the course of transport from the source to the sink. So there are, there are never monosaccharides translocated, at least very many. There may be a few in there, but not much. Monosaccharides transported in any plants. What is transported is disaccharides, trisaccharides, tetrasaccharides, and pentasaccharides. The most common one is sucrose. And you know sucrose is a disaccharide composed of glucose and fructose. That's the most common one. And f f um, sucrose is referred to as a non-reducing sugar because the reducing parts of fructose and glucose have been used up when you form the, the um, glycoside bond that joins the two together to make a disaccharide. So sucrose is a non-reducing sugar where the, these guys are reducing sugars. So sucrose is by far the most common, but there are lots of other types. You can add a galactose, a different type of hexose sugar, onto sucrose and make raffinose. Raffinose is also relatively common. You can add another galactose on and make stachyose, or add another galactose on and make verbascose. And these larger sugars, we'll see, are translocated in very specific types of plants. Okay, so the, the, the phylogenetic distribution of the types of sugars that are transported, the types of sugars that are transported follow very specific phylogenetic distributions. And we'll see why that is in just a few minutes. Okay, um, other, other um, types of plants translocate sugar alcohols. So this is mannitol. There's another one closely related to this called sorbitol. Um, for example, apple trees and prune trees and cherry trees. Sorbitol is the compound that's translocated from the leaves to the, the metabolic sinks. Okay, so there's a number of different types of compounds that can be translocated, but remember what they're doing this for. It's the same thing as we talked about for starch in the chloroplasts at night. These compounds are being translocated for two purposes. One, energy resources, and two, carbon skeletons. The roots have to grow. They have to make proteins. Where do the carbon skeletons for the, the amino acids in, that are made in the roots come from? They come from whatever compounds are translocated from the leaves. Okay, So both energy and carbon uh, skeletons. So it's not just sugars. We said there's also... Um, nitrogen-containing compounds, and the most common ones are amino acids. Um, if you remember your amino acids, there are two related ones, glutamic acid and glutamine. Glutamine has got an extra nitrogen on it. It makes sense to translocate compounds like glutamine because per five carbons, it's got two nitrogens on it rather than one. Right? So these glutamine and Asparagine are the most common ones that are translocated because there are two nitrogens per carbon skeleton rather than one. 
in species where there is nitrogen fixation. They have nitrogen fixing bacteria associated with the roots. They translocate other groups of compounds, these ureides, and you can see these guys have lots of nitrogens in them. Again, more efficient nitrogen transport because there's more nitrogens per carbon in there. Okay. So nitrogen is another thing that, that is being translocated. One of the questions you should be asking yourself right away when we think about this metabolic sources and sinks, it's easy to think about this in terms of carbon going from the leaves to the roots or leaves to the fruit or leaves to the, the young developing leaves. But how about nitrogen? Nitrogen, we said, and we'll see in a couple lectures when we talk about nitrogen assimilation. Some plants do it in the roots. Other plants do it in the leaves. Some plants do it in both. So the metabolic sources and sinks for sugar movement may be the same, but may be different than the metabolic sources and sinks for movement of other compounds. And one of the things you need to be thinking about is how this can be accomplished. Okay, so let's think a little bit about the, um, the plumbing system through which this pressure-driven bulk flow happens. So the phloem is typically phloem tissue. Phloem, a tissue is a number of different types of cells, and there are really four different types of cells in the phloem. The two important ones are the sieve elements. They're basically the pipes of the phloem and the closely associated companion cells. Every sieve element has an associated companion cell. So unlike the xylem, which was dead at maturity, the phloem is alive. But I think it's fair to say it's barely alive. If you look in the phloem, there's no nucleus. Uh, sorry, if you look in the sieve elements, there are no nuclei. There's very little endoplasmic reticulum. There are virtually no mitochondria or chloroplasts. But it does have a plasma membrane. And it does have some metabolic functions. The companion cell that goes along with every sieve element is basically the living part of the, of the phloem, of the sieve elements all the metabolic control that is required for what's going on in the sieve element is accomplished by the companion cell. And companion cells and their associated sieve elements are always connected by a large network of plasma desmina. So one of the things you should be thinking about I'm not going to give you the answer, but you should be thinking about this. In the xylem, the cells are dead, no plasma membrane. In the phloem, the cells are sort of alive, but there definitely is a plasma membrane. Why does the phloem have a plasma membrane in the xylem not? I'm not going to answer it now. I don't want you to answer it now. I want you to be thinking about it. But one of the things the presence of a plasma membrane should immediately bring to mind is, OK, what about transport from one sieve element to the next? Because if there's plasma membranes there or just plasma desmina, that's going to be pretty limiting to transport. And phloem transport happens at the, on the same rates as xylem transport. You know, it can be meters per hour. And what allows that to happen is at the ends of these sieve elements, are large, basically, looks like a colander. They're called sieve plates. I think I got micrograph, yeah. So here's a picture uh, looking at the sieve plate going this way. And here's pictures of the holes in the sieve plates. They're hundreds of times bigger than plasma desmata. It turns out developmentally, this, the holes in the sieve plates start off as plasma desmata, but they enlarge during development of the sieve elements. So there's basically large pores that connect one sieve element to the next that allows for bulk flow to happen relatively easily. Nevertheless, along the edge of the sieve element and through the pores, it's lined by plasma membrane. Right? So the question still is relevant. Why is there a plasma membrane there in the, in the phloem and not in the xylem? 
OK, I want to finish up talking about the structure of the xylem by talking about two different types of companion cells. Companion cells, actually, the book talks about three types. There's actually many different types of companion cells. But there's sort of two at the end of the spectrums of companion cells that we'll talk about that we'll see are important in the overall picture of what's going on in the phloem. The, the, at one end of the spectrum, we have what's called an ordinary companion cell. So if we think about this ordinary companion cell, here's the sieve element, and here's the companion cell. an ordinary companion cell. And we said that there are lots of plasma desmata that connect the companion cell with the sieve element. So these lines are re meant to represent plasma desmata. But if we think about, particularly in the leaves of a vein, sorry, the veins of a leaf, in the veins of a leaf, what, what we ultimately want to have happen is the sugar that's produced from photosynthesis in the mesophyll cells, we want to get it into these sieve elements. If the leaves are being metabolic sources, then somehow we got to get that sugar in there. Interestingly, in the ordinary companion cells, there are no plasma desmata. connecting to the other cells. These other cells might be phloem parenchyma or bundle sheath cells, cells that sit between the phloem, between the sieve elements and the companion cells, and the rest of the cells of the leaf. So there's lots of plasma desmata connecting the companion cell to the sieve element, but there's no plasma desmata connecting it to other cells. Let's contrast this with another type called transfer cells. No, they're called intermediary cells, sorry. In these intermediary cells, we also have a sieve element and a companion cell. And there's lots of plasma desmata that connect these guys between the companion cell and the sieve element. But now, there's lots of plasma desmata that connect it to all the rest of the cells. OK, so here there are many plasma desmata. connect to the other cells. And what this should indicate to you, that in, or, in order to get sugars from the rest of the leaf into the sieve elements of plants that have ordinary companion cells, there is an obligate apoplastic root here. If there are no plasma desmata that connect the companion cells or the sieve elements to any of the other cells in the leaf, then there must be some, there's an obligate apoplastic path. Path for sugar to follow from the mesophyll cells into the phloem. Where in plants that have these intermediary cells, where the companion cells have lots of plasma desmata connecting to the sieve element, but also lots of plasma desmata connecting to everything else. This has a symplastic path. So right away, these two different types of companion cells, differentiated only by the presence or absence of plasma desmata connecting the companion cells to all the other cells in the leaf tell us that there must be at least two different mechanisms by which sugars get from the mesophyll cells 
into the flow. And we'll talk about this in just a second. Yes? So, you can't, can you have different kinds of companies built in the same region? No. Or no. It's by species. It's by species. Yep. Yep, it's by species. And we'll see, I'll give part of it away now, that plants that have this apoplastic path have ordinary companion cells. Those are plants that, that translocate sucrose. Plants that have this symplastic path, lots of plasmodesmal plasmidal connections, they, have, they, tr they translocate raffinose and stachyose and verbascose. So there's a, there's a correlation between the types of sugars that are translocated and the characteristics of the companion cells. And obviously, that's related to the mechanism by which sugars get into these cells by a symplastic root here and an apoplastic root here. So we'll come back and talk about these in just a second. All right, the, the key thing is that this should tell us that there is a range of mechanisms by which sucrose, the products of photosynthesis, can be loaded into the phloem. And they must be loaded, right? We gotta, gener we gotta have a high sugar concentration here to generate the pressure that's going to drive bulk flow. The source, metabolic sources have to be the high pressure end of the phloem. So there has to be some mechanism by which the sugars are loaded into the phloem so that water can enter osmotically, so the pressure can be high and drive the flow. Okay. So I think, yeah, I got some pictures here. So these are um, sieve elements in the phloem. This is an ordinary companion cell. And although you don't see them, there would normally be lots of, there are lots of plasmodesmata here. But there are no plasmodesmata connecting it to its neighbors. If we look at an intermediary cell, here's the sieve elements, here's the intermediary cell. Again, you don't really see the plasmodesma here, but they're there. But it's very easy to see the plasmodesma that connect the intermediary cells with the cells that are surrounding them. Okay, so it's this connection between the companion cells and the rest of the tissue that differentiates these two types of companion cells that differentiates the mechanism by which sucrose gets from the mesophyll cells into the sieve elements. And like I said, we'll come back and talk about that in just a minute. Okay, questions on this before we go on? Does that mean the intermediary cell is companion cell more than one sieve element? No. Typically, they're, they're one to one. So in a developmental sense, the precursor cell for the companion cell and the sieve element is the same cell. So it goes through one division, and one of the daughters becomes the sieve element, and one of the daughters becomes the companion cell, and then those are both done. They don't divide anymore. Okay? So it's, they're, they're one to one with each other. One companion cell, one sieve element. Okay? Any other questions? Okay, I want to spend just a minute talking about metabolic sources and sinks because obviously this is going to be the key to driving phloem transport. So let's just make a list of metabolic sources in a plant. What are things that can act as metabolic sources? Leaves, okay, let's be more specific, because not all leaves will be metabolic sources. Mature leaves. What else? Yeah, storage tissues, like roots and things like that. Think of anything else? There's one more that we should be thinking about based on things we've talked about. Well, that would be 
the, the roots that, are, that store well, starch in them. Mm, okay, so roots in terms of being a um, source for reduced uh, nitrogen compounds that are being distributed to the rest of the plant. Yes, that can happen, but I should have been more specific. Let's talk about carbon. But you're, you're bringing up a good point. Nitrogen can be, a, can be a, a source in the roots where the roots are sinks for carbon. One other thing that should be on this list. We talked about mobilization of nutrients under certain conditions. Often senescing leaves or senescing tissues. So for example, the deciduous trees around here in the fall, before those leaves fall off, every bit of mobile carbon and nitrogen is removed from the leaves. Basically, by the time the leaf is ready to fall off the tree, it's just cellulose that's left there. Right? So senescing tissues are other sources. Let's make a list of sinks. Well, roots typically are sinks. What else? Yeah, flowers. What else? Fruits. Say that again. Fruits. Fruits, yeah. One more thing we should add to the list. Yeah, growing leaves, developing leaves. One more. Well, developing leaves. The developing leaves, those are like growing shoots. Where do these guys get the stuff they're storing from? Where did the potato or the roots, cassava roots, or whatever you're talking about, get its stuff from that it stored? They have to be sinks at some time to fill it up with stuff, right? Okay, and the reason I wanted to make this list is to get you to recognize that under some circumstances, leaves can be sources, and other circumstances, they can be sinks. In some circumstances, storage tissues can be sources, and other circumstances, they can be sinks. These are dynamic things, and what has to change are the properties that determine how flow happens in the phloem, right? It's pressure-driven flow from the source to the sink. So that means the high-pressure and low-pressure regions in the phloem change over time depending upon the types of metabolism that are going on in those tissues. It's not hard to see that what's happening in sources is you're either making photosynthate or you're taking starches or other storage compounds and making them more osmotically active by breaking them down into simple sugars. You're taking proteins and breaking them down to amino acids. All of these are increasing the osmotic characteristics. They're making the solute potential more negative. Where these guys are using those compounds up, they're either, either metabolizing them and burning them up in respiration, or they're converting them into bigger polymers that are less osmotically active. So these are sources of negative solute potential, and these are sinks of more po or less negative solute potential. Right? So it's the metabolic characteristics of those tissues that is determining whether it's a source or whether it's a sink, and whether it's going to be high pressure or low pressure end of the phloem transport. Okay, another example that the pathways that the solutes in the phloem can, can travel are plastic is, let's just take this same experiment that we talked about a minute ago, enclose this older leaf in a plastic bag and put C14 in it. We saw that the, 
the, the products primarily go to the younger leaves on the same side of the plant. Let's pull off the older leaves on the opposite side of the plant and repeat the experiment. And what you see is now the carbon is being translocated to younger leaves, not just on the same side of the plant, but on the other side of the plant. Okay, so it's not as if there is a one-to-one -one connection between sources and sinks, that every source connects to a unique sink. The connections are more general than that, and they can be controlled depending upon environmental conditions. If an herbivore came and eat, ate these leaves off of one side of the plant, then the translocation of sugars from the older leaves can be changed to support the development of younger leaves on the, all sides of the plants, not just on the same side of the plant. Okay, so keep in mind that these transport paths are dynamic. They can be changed according to the needs of the plant. All right? So let's now try and put all this together. We know something about the plumbing system. We know something about the metabolism of the sources and the sinks that are either generating solutes that will create a more negative solute potential or use up the solutes that are going to, um, so that water will move out and make a lower pressure um, that should drive the bulk flow. So let's put this together now and look at this pressure flow model for how transport in the phloem happens. And the easiest way to think about this, so first of all, this half of the diagram over here is xylem, this half of the diagram over here is phloem. So in the phloem, we designate source tissues and sink tissues and the plumbing that connects it. Right? Let's do nothing more than think about the source tissue as an osmometer. Remember when we first talked about water potential, we talked about the perfect osmometer and that cells weren't, weren't perfect because the cell walls could expand a little bit. Let's just think about what's happening in this source osmometer. We have the mesophyll cells in the leaf producing sugars. Remember we said that the triose phosphate that's made in the chloroplast is converted into sucrose and it's almost always sucrose in all cells independent of what's translocated in the phloem. What goes from the cells in the leaf to the phloem is almost always sucrose. So the sucrose gets by some pathway that we haven't completely described yet and is accumulated in the phloem very often expending energy to concentrate the sugars in the flow. Some sort of active transport. We'll see that there's different kinds of this. So the net result is we have high concentrations of sugars in the flow. Water enters osmotically in response to that low, that negative solute potential. And as water enters, the pressure in the phloem goes up. So the source osmometer in the phloem is generating the pressure by using energy to accumulate solutes. The opposite happens in the sink osmometer. In the sink, those compounds that are being translocated are being either used up metabolically. If it was sucrose, it could be used as a as a source for respiration. So you're using up the compound. Or you're taking that sucrose and maybe you're storing it as starch in the roots. Or you're converting it into amino acids which make proteins. You're making bigger polymers out of smaller molecules. In any event, you're decreasing the concentration of solutes in the sink tissues. That makes the solute potential less negative. Water leaves osmotically and you have low pressure here. So the two osmometers, the source osmometer and the sink osmometer, through osmo osmosis processes at the cellular level is creating a pressure gradient that drives intercellular bulk flow through the phloem. This, this should be the easy part. understanding the source and sink osmometers, and then you basically have a low resistance pathway. The sieve elements with their big holes connecting them, the sieve plates, 
a low resistance pathway to allow the source and the sink to um, transport things between each other. Let's imagine a scenario where we could turn off the production of solutes in the leaves. Okay, so let's just say we add a metabolic inhibitor that inhibits photosynthesis. What's going to happen to phloem transport under those conditions? Well, which one? Uh, or both? Uh, <laughs> would it reverse either from sink or sink to source? Um, or not sink to source necessarily, but like storage? Yeah, storage. yeah. It could in, over the longer period, yes, that could happen. But immediately, over, over short time scales, both of your answers are correct. Initially, it's going to slow down. And eventually, when the pressure here is equal to the pressure in the sources, it will stop. Right? It's just pressure driven bulk flow. And if you stop, if you inhibit metabolic processes in the leaf, it takes only a matter of minutes for transport in the, in the phloem to stop. It's completely dependent upon the generation of pressure in the source. Using up stuff in the sink does not create enough pressure to really drive phloem transport. It's the accumulation of solutes in the source that matters. Stella? So if the pressure gradient stops, is then gravity going to come an issue? Uh, yeah, so is gravity, is gravity going to be an issue for phloem transport? Well, I guess it sort of depends on which way it's going in the phloem, right? If it's going down, then gravity will assist it. If it's going up, then gravity is going to be, you're going to have to work against gravity. For distance across the cell, gravity doesn't matter at all. But if you've got a 10 meter tall tree, then gravity is significant. Yeah, so it'll take more pressure to drive upward transport in the phloem than it will to drive downward transport in the phloem. Okay, so now here's an experiment you have to explain to me. Okay, here's a plant, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to put um, tritiated hydrogen-labeled compounds, so let's just say it might be a sugar here, and feed it to the roots. And up here, we're going to give C14, CO2, and feed it to the leaves. And what we're going to do is we're going to sit here on the stem, and we're going to watch for stuff that's moving. And what we observe is that C14 moves down and that tritium moves up. At any given time, you can observe in the same stem bidirectional transport. So the question is, are the compounds that contain tritium in them moving through the same phloem cells that the compounds that have C14 in them? How about Patrick? Are the compounds that have tritium in it moving in the through the same phloem cells as the compounds that have C14 in it? No. Why not? Well, let's, if it was diffusion, could they trans move in opposite directions in the same cell? Can you have one thing diffusing this way and another thing diffusing this way in the same cell? Yeah. Absolutely. But is it diffusion that's moving things around in the flow? It's bulk flow. So these must be moving in different sets of cells. And one of those sets of cells must be connecting the source and the roots to a sink maybe in developing leaves. And another set of cells is connecting sources of the leaves to sinks and the roots. Okay. So there's an important take home message from this experiment that's not really emphasized in the book. That at any given time, some of the phloem may be going in the opposite direction to the way the most of the phloem is going. 
And this becomes really important when we think about the role that phloem plays, not in moving nutrients around, but in moving signaling molecules around. If signaling molecules are, need to be sent from the roots to the leaves through the phloem, if there's no phloem transport that's going up, they'll never get there. So at any given time, there's almost always phloem transport going in both directions, although 95% of it may be in one direction. There's always some going in the other direction. But that also raises interesting things. How do you get the right compounds, how do you get the compounds you want translocated to those cells that are going to load them into the phloem that's going in the direction that you want? And the honest answer is, we don't know all the answers to that. We know what happens because compounds, trans, um, signaling molecules are specifically transported in certain directions that may be going in the opposite direction that most of the phloem transport is. Okay. So there's always some transport that's going in the other direction, but how the compounds find that phloem is a question that we don't really know the answer to. Okay, we're going to spend the next, the rest of the time pretty much, talking about the processes that are going on up here to get the sugars from the mesophyll cells into the sieve elements so that the pressure can go up so that we can drive phloem transport. And we talked about two types of companion cells. All companion cells have lots of plasma desmata that connect the companion cell with the sieve element. What differs is whether or not there are plasma desmata on this side that connect it with the rest of the tissue. We said that in ordinary companion cells, no plasma desmata. In intermediary cells, tons of plasma desmata. So the last thing we really need to think about in this picture are the different mechanisms of what's referred to as phloem loading. What are the mechanisms through which energy is used to concentrate sugars in the phloem so that there's high pressure and driving phloem transport? Okay. So let's compare, just visually for now, the pathway by which a sugar would move from a mesophyll cell into a sieve element with these two different types of companion cells where we have an ordinary companion cell and these intermediary cells. Okay, so let's look at the, the intermediary cell first. Remember, that's the one that has lots of plasmodesmal connections between the intermediary cell and the cells that are back towards the sugar source. All the companion cells have plasmodesmal connections with the sieve element. So that means there is a continuous symplastic pathway from the mesophyll cells for sugars to move into the sieve element. What's wrong with this picture? Something should be, a bell should be going off in your head. What's the concentration of sugars in the sieve element compared to the concentrations of sugars in the mesophyll cells? if what we just described a minute ago is working. It's higher. How can you get more sugars in the, in the sieve element if there's just symplastic connections? Because if you, if you pump them in here, they just leak back out through the plasma desma, right? So there's something going on here that we're missing, we need to think about. Let's look at the other system where we have no plasma desmina connecting the companion cell to its adjacent cells. So sugars can move symplastically until they get to this barrier. Now if we have high sugars in the companion cell in the sieve element, can we easily explain how we get higher sugars here than in the rest of these cells? What, what accounts for it? Active transport, right? So somewhere in here there's active transport that's pumping the sugars into these cells. And that's exactly correct. In the cell, in the um, plants that have ordinary companion cells with no plasma desmina at this boundary, there is active transport of sugars using a mechanism we've already talked about, that is using the energy of a proton gradient 
to co-transport sugars from the apoplast into the companion cell. So it's a very typical sort of thing that the cell is expanding, expending energy in the form of the proton gradient made by the proton pump to pump sucrose into the companion cell. And once it's in the companion cell, once it's in the companion cell, it just goes through the plasma desmond into the sieve element. What's missing in this picture? Follow the sugar along the path. Starting off in the mesophyll cell. What's missing? How the sugar got? Where? What is this space out here? Cell wall, right? Apoplast or symplast? Where's the sugars that are moving from the mesophyll cells where the sugar was produced? Those sugars are moving symplastically. Symplastically. How do they get out of the symplast into the apoplast so that they could be transported using energy back into the symplast of the companion cell? Can't you use that mechanism twice? Sure, you could. You could pump it out, but it isn't. We're not really sure what the answer to that is. Yes? Isn't a cell wall just porous so you can get over there? Yeah, but isn't there a plasma membrane between this symplast and the cell wall? And does, does, will sucrose just cross the plasma membrane? Probably not. So that's a big question. That there's, there's a lot of answers that have been suggested. But we don't really know what's happening along this boundary to get the sugars out of the symplast and into the apoplast so that they can then be actively transported into the symplast of the companion cell and sit on. So although the, the, the overall pathway seems relatively straightforward, what's happening at this boundary remains a question. So there's still, still um, good projects for graduate students in plant physiology to work on. Lots of them. Yeah? Why did we say that the pressure at the sieve um, element must be lower, higher than the pressure at the mesophyll cell? Um, so let's imagine a scenario where there's no active transport of anything. So you're producing sugars here. So would that, could that give you a moderately high concentration of sugars here? Not as high as here. Here's where the sugars are being made. That's going to be the highest concentration. It diffuses down a gradient. But you could get the sugar concentration here almost as high, right? right? And there are plants that do that. In fact, there are big plants that do that. All the willow trees that you see around here, those big honking trees that are, stay yellow so long in the fall. They just, they, there's no active transport anywhere in this. They just, the sugar just follows symplastically all the way here. But most of the plants that have this physiology, that have intermediary cells, actually concentrate sugars in here. Remember we said that these guys are the ones that transport sucrose. We know why they transport sucrose now, because there's a sucrose proton co-transporter that's concentrating the sugars in there. These guys transport, if it's a willow tree, they transport sucrose. But if it's the other types of uh, plants, cucurbits are the most common ones, squashes and cucumbers and stuff, the sugars that are transported in here are raffinose and stachyose. So we have to figure out, and they're at a much higher concentration than the sugars in the mesophyll cells. So there's something interesting going on there. And we'll finish up by talking about what this interesting thing is. This is actually stuff that was done by a guy upstairs, just down the hall from me, Bob Turgeon. He's a professor in plant biology. And the mechanism of this that's been proposed here was discovered by an undergraduate working in his lab 20 years ago. An undergraduate came to him and proposed this. And he said, that's crap. That can't happen. And she proved him wrong. This is what happens. Here's the story. So 
Here's our intermediary cell. And remember, the intermediary cell distinguishes itself from the normal companion cells in that it not only has plasmodesmal connections to the sieve element, it also has them to the neighboring cells. In this case, it shows a bundle cheese cell. Okay. So what happens here is sucrose, which is made in the mesophyll cells, is moving symplastically into the um, bundle sheath cells and into the intermediary cell. But in the intermediary cell, that sucrose gets galactose added onto it, making raffinose, or gets two galactoses and makes stachyose. And the thing that is, seems weird but has been proven to be correct is that raffinose and stachyose are bigger than sucrose and they cannot go back through these plasmodesmata. They're too small for these things to go back. But they are large enough to go through these plasmodesmata and get into the sieve element. So this is called a polymer trap model. It's a polymer trap because you're taking a small polymer and making a larger one, and you're trapping it because these plasmodesmata will let the small polymer move through, sucrose, but not let the larger polymer raffinose or stachyose to move through. So the net result is you're using up sucrose in here, right? To make the raffinose, you're using up the sucrose. So the sucrose concentration is low. So you get a diffusion gradient for sucrose to move in. You build up the raffinose and stachyose, but it can't go back out. Right? But it happens that these plasmodesmin are bigger and it can get into the sieve element. So you've trapped those larger polymers in there. Is there energy involved in this process? Let's put it this way. Thermodynamically, should there be energy involved in this process? Yeah, of course, because you've got higher concentrations of sugars in here than you have out here. And where that energy comes in is in the synthesis, synthesis of raffinose and stachyose. It takes ATP to do that. So we have two contrasting models. The polymer trap model that have companion cells that have plasmodesma on both sides, and that these guys transport raffinose and stachyose. And we have the other model where the companion cells have plasmodesma only on the side facing the sieve element, where sugars are concentrated using a sucrose proton cotransporter, and the sugar that's translocated is sucrose rather than a raffinose or stachyose. So both of them are accomplishing the same thing. High concentrations of sugars in the sieve element companion cell complex. Water moves in osmotically, builds up the pressure, makes the system work. Okay? Since there's an aqueduct floating associated with the ordinary companion cell, and there's a syntactic, uh, syntactic floating associated with the intermediary cell, yep. They don't what? They don't conflict? No, they don't conflict. You never find them in the same plant, right? You find one in one type of plant, and you find the other in different types of plants. And then there's the third type, like the willow trees, that don't have any active flow loading. It's just the high concentrations of sugars that are made in the mesophyll cells that drive the whole thing. And you think that that would be a problem for willow trees since they're so big, right? that these ones that can generate higher pressure by expending energy would somehow be better. But they're not. So turn the question around. If they're not better, then why do we have flow loading at all? Right? Why do the plants spend energy to load things into the flow? Don't know the answers to these things. Don't know the answers to these things. We can only observe that they're there and try and correlate that with other phenomena. We don't really know why. There have been a lot of really interesting studies that have been done on this. So, take home messages. The things that you want to remember from this lecture. The pressure flow model is a very simple model. It's just two coupled osmometers. Source osmometer, sink osmometer, low resistance pathway con um, connecting them. The other thing that's important is sources and sinks are dynamic. They can change in time. They can change with development. And at any given time, there's going to be transport going in opposite directions in any branch, any leaf, perhaps even in most petioles. 
It may be dominated by one direction, but there's almost certainly going to be something going the other direction most of the time. And the last is that there's different types of phloem loading. There's, there's plants that have no phloem loading, like willows, and then there's the apoplastic and symplastic pathways, both of which accomplish getting higher concentrations of sugars in the phloem to produce the highest pressures there. The pressures are high. I mean, the pressures can be 100 times the pressure in a car tire in some plants. So as, as negative a pressure there was in the xylem under high tension, in the phloem you can have very high positive pressure. Okay.